Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on October 24th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we have two topics today. Later on in this hour, we're going to get the latest update about a plan to pump a million gallons of water a day from a North Florida spring to a water bottling plant. And whenever we talk about this plan to bottle water from Florida Springs, people get fired up. So I hope you stay tuned for that. First up, though, we're going to talk about a special legislative session that's been called by the governor, among other things. It's to impose state sanctions on Iran. Yesterday, the Florida Senate posted it that will posted that it will begin the special session at 10 o'clock in the morning on November 6th and could finish the session as early as November 8th. Joining me. Now by Zoom to talk about that is a critic of the plan. State Representative Anna Escamani is a Democrat from the Orlando area. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Representative Escamani. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad you could join us. So soon after the special session was announced, you posted on X that you despise the government of Iran, but you call but the call for a special session by Governor Ron DeSantis is wasting Floridian taxpayer money for his failing presidential bid. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think listeners should know, too, that I I am the first and only at this point Iranian-American elected any public office in Florida. So when I say that I despise the Islamic Republic of Iran, I, I mean it. You know, my family fled Iran um, in search of freedom. And in fact, I have family in Iran that have, I have not seen in, in more than a decade uh, because of the political environment and because of the fear for safety if I were to go to Iran. Um, and, and to that same point, the United States has had intense sanctions placed on Iran for decades. And really seeing Governor Ron DeSantis exploit what is a, a, a horrific crisis taking place um, in Israel and Gaza for his own political gain, it doesn't surprise me, but it's not going to make things better. In fact, um, pursuing such an agenda will only further isolate individuals who are experiencing Islamophobia right now. Um, and of course, you know, if your intent is to somehow financially harm the Iranian government, that I would encourage you to work with the U.S. federal government who has already pursued economic sanctions. So I do see this as just more politics. I see this as performance. And it's frustrating because Floridians need us to focus on things like property insurance and funding public education and the affordability crisis. In fact, I'm joining you from one of my local um, uh, homeless service providers where we were volunteering this morning because the need is so great here in Central Florida, where we are giving in any way we can to address the, the crises at home which is the job of state government. But unfortunately, DeSantis continues to use his bully pulpit for his failing presidential bid. And we'll talk certainly about the issues that are important to Floridians as we go throughout this uh, this interview. I do want to um, continue to talk just a, for a minute or two more about uh, this special session on Iran. The state government of Florida is is calling essentially to do some international diplomacy or 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 sanctions or something like that. Um, and people right now might be confused because right before you joined us, we had a one hour program and the whole all the news was about the Israel Hamas war in that. And I don't remember Iran being mentioned once. And recently, Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said that the U.S. has not found evidence that Iran was directly involved in the Hamas attacks. So why is the state of Florida seemingly going against going after Iran here? Yeah, it's a great example. You know, I think it should be noted that the Islamic Republic of Iran, you know, does have proxies, you know, throughout the region of the Middle East. And Hamas is one of their proxies. And there has been uh, comments made and evidence provided over the years of just the funding streams for different organizations, whether it's Hamas, Hezbollah, and others. But to your point, when we specifically look at this terrorist attack that took place, killing more than a thousand Israelis, if there was some sort of direct connection to the Iranian government. And at this point, we need the United States or IDF have been able to identify such a connection. And so our focus really should be on taking care of those here in Florida. You know, we've seen a rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia across the Sunshine State. There, there is now absolutely an opportunity to focus on keeping everyone safe in our communities, ensuring a dialogue and ensuring that we don't see a rise of hate crimes here in Florida. Uh, but to go after a foreign government as a state government is not only unheard of, 
But it also begs the question of what businesses is Florida engaging with in Iran that sanctions are even necessary? And this is a question that I've asked more than once. And I, I'm, I'm very concerned if Governor DeSantis is engaging with Iran in some business matter because that potentially evades federal sanctions. So again, so much of this feels more performative. And it reminds me of some of the attacks that Governor DeSantis has wielded towards the Chinese American community as well. In his past legislative session, uh, we saw Senate Bill 264 pass, which targets Chinese Americans and, and those of Chinese descent and their ability to purchase homes here in Florida um, to the point where one of my local private schools was accused of being influenced by the CCP, though there is no evidence that has since been provided by the state on that claim. But these are just examples of Governor DeSantis attempting to act presidential by targeting different foreign adversaries. And of course, I say attempting to look presidential because even his base has not been impressed by any of these attempts. One one more example maybe of the governor kind of getting involved in international politics here is there's this nonprofit called Project Dynamo that flies, it's based in Tampa and it flies people to safety in the US and they were planning on doing some flights to get Americans home from Israel. And uh, of course the, the governor jumped in and, and offered them to fund the flights. It's costing the state taxpayers money. It's a great thing to protect Americans, but you, I think I've heard, let me tell you what, um, Fentress Driscoll said, House Minority Leader Fentress Dris Driscoll here in Tampa, a Democrat, says she hopes all Americans in the region can safely get back home. But she also said that it appears that Governor DeSantis has overstepped the federal government to further his political ambitions. Well, and, and to that point, there was a reporting from the Orlando Sentinel of how some of these flights were delayed because of state contractors and the state not respecting the expertise of organizations like Project Dynamo and trying to insert their own players in these evacuations, which led to some individuals being stranded for several days in Cyprus before they could get back to the United States. So time and time again, we see Governor DeSantis just looking for headlines. And that is nothing new. You know, the entire 2023 legislative session was Governor DeSantis, even if it was unconstitutional, even if it wasn't effective, even if it was uh, a policy proposal that never came to fruition. So much of what he does really is about getting those headlines. Our guest is State Representative Ana Escamani, a Democrat from the Orlando area. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Uh, some of the other topics that will be covered during this special session are providing additional assistance to people recovering from Hurricane Idalia and taking steps to increase the number of students with disabilities served in a school voucher program. I don't know if you if you want to touch on either of those um, topics that, that will be uh, brought up at the special session. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's worth noting that if the legislature is attempting to reallocate dollars towards specific programs and there is no statutory change, we actually don't need a special session to do that. Anytime there's a, a, a need to reallocate funding, we can host what's called a legislative budget committee meeting, which is um, a much smaller convening of scale where House members and senators in that committee can decide on different budgetary needs. Oftentimes, a state agency will request that dollars be moved in some way, and that can be done without a special session. I do feel like some of these additional items that were added to the agenda is an intent by Florida Republicans to give off the impression that this special session um, isn't just a political uh, performance, but that they're actually trying to address issues that Floridians need us to. But I would reiterate that we don't need a special session to do some of this. In fact, moving dollars to different programs can be done through the Legislative Budget Committee. With that said, the need for students with disabilities who are participating in the voucher program is a legitimate one. In fact, when the legislature expanded to universal vouchers, uh, based on anecdotal evidence and, and more data being released, it does seem like many of our schools that focus on kids with disabilities and those families directly were left behind. And in fact, my office has received many emails uh, from families who are in this situation, who are not getting the reimbursements, and these schools are being made 
being forced to make tough decisions because they don't have the money coming in to stay open. Now, of course, this is a larger conversation on how are we actually funding disability services in Florida when we have a wait list of more than 20,000 people with the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. Uh, but to that same point, it does seem like Universal Vouchers has allowed individuals who don't need the financial resources to get public money for private schools. Meanwhile, the kids that actually do need these resources uh, don't seem to be getting them. Our guest is State Representative Ana Escamani, a Democrat from the Orlando area. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Representative Escamani, over the weekend, you, you tweeted a Newsweek article that said the skyrocketing cost of insurance premiums in Florida is leading residents to drop their insurance, consider selling their home, and even move out of the state, according to recent reports. So the, the um, Florida legislature has already had special sessions about solving the insurance crisis. Uh, they, you know, they did tell us it would take time, but uh, where what's happening with the insurance crisis here in the state of Florida? Well, the reality, Sean, is that we don't have time. Floridians don't have time. As you saw in that Newsweek article, uh, some individuals have experienced insurance premium hikes upwards of 900% of what they originally were paying. And of course, we see more and more Floridians who are leaving the state because of the economic situation where um, they may be paying more taxes in a state like Illinois, but they have better benefits and they, of course, don't see uh, the skyrocketing insurance premiums as they experience here in the Sunshine State. This is a, a crisis that deserves our attention. And what frustrates me is the special session about a year ago uh, that many of my Republican colleagues said would would help within uh, 18 months has led to nowhere. And in fact, I voted no on that policy proposal because I didn't think it was going to deliver any real results. And what it did instead was made it harder to hold insurance companies accountable. We need reforms that focus on consumers. We need reforms that provide relief to families that are facing hardship because of the cost of property insurance. And I do think one of the quick steps we can take that should be addressed during this special session is to put more money into the My Safe Florida Home Program, which is a home hardening initiative to help Floridians improve their homes so that they can maybe get their premiums reduced. But candidly, we need to put investments in uh, reinsurance that are much larger than what have ever been done before so that we can reduce that cost for consumers. And I would argue we need to stop making citizens the uh, difficult to access. At this point, people deserve a public option. Um, they need some sort of safety net while the market stabilizes. And I'm very concerned about the fact that we do everything we can to make citizens less accessible to people when when really, I understand its, its original creation was supposed to be the insurer of last resort, but citizens really has become the insurer of only resort. And it is backed by the state. So the state will ensure that it ha it is solvent, which is what something that is not guaranteed in the private market as Floridians continue to not only see rate hikes, but they are straight up just losing coverage, just getting canceled. And I have some constituents that are getting canceled in the middle of repairs, which makes it even more difficult to find any type of coverage. And if they have a mortgage, they're being placed in forced insurance, which can be two or three times higher. And for if they don't have a mortgage, some people are deciding to go uninsured, which is incredibly dangerous. But that has become the reality for our community, which is why we need some serious consumer-focused reforms and not just a continuation of giving insurance companies what they want. On the point of citizens' property insurance, it's true that citizens is taking on a lot of uh, a lot more coverage, a lot more uh, policies than anticipated at the beginning. But essentially, for a lot of people, as you mentioned, it's a it's a decent insurance for them to have. And there's this it seems like there's this obsession to kick people off of citizens that the they're given choices of inferior insurance that's either more expensive or doesn't isn't as stable as citizens' property insurance. That doesn't seem to be a solution. No, and I, and I think we need to question some of the indis, industry talking points on this. So, you know, I often hear from folks, well, we, we can't have citizens be uh, large. We can't have people go to citizens because the state will get bankrupt if there's a disaster. And I think it's important to stress that the entire concept of insurance is to share risk. And if more people who are not in a place of risk, right, there are homes in Florida that are located on the coast, 
that are more at risk when it comes to things like wind damage and flooding and so forth than there are homes in other parts of the state. If we share risk with one another, then you're not going to have a situation that folks have painted the context of citizens uh, facing insolvency. And of course, you know, Florida also has really strong reserves. And a part of that is for a rainy day, as we saw during the pandemic. And I also want to point out that so much of Florida's hurricane response is federally reimbursed. In fact, I set in on a community on a committee meeting last week focused on um, the Florida Department of Emergency Management and just how effective we have been in securing reimbursements. These are federal reimbursements. So Florida doesn't really have a lot of state dollars and expenses in disaster recovery. So much of it's reimbursed. And it should also be noted that 30 some percent of Florida's state budget is federally funded as well. So the least we can do is to use some of our state dollars to support Floridians who are struggling and suffering right now. And of course, part of this too is we need to take climate change seriously. You know, insurance companies are calculating the risk of climate change and the premiums they give to us, yet the state of Florida doesn't integrate that into our risk assessment, to our uh, um, risk mitigation plans. You know, we still have a state government that doesn't want to accept the realities of climate change. And so not only do we need to be proactive on that front, but I, I, I think we look at state dollars and we keep things, you know, to ourselves and reserves. Meanwhile, people cannot afford to live. And these are our tax payers that deserve to have money put back into their pocket, whether in a direct way or through an indirect way, like boosting up support programs via citizens. And so I, I, I don't think it's a solution to kick people off when they don't have another alternative. Our guest is State Representative Ana Escamani, a Democrat from the Orlando area. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about higher education. There, there was a, a bill in Florida that was passed into law, SB 266, which took away diversity, equity, and inclusion programs from higher ed. And uh, I'll read here a sentence from the Tampa Bay Times, a proposed regulation aimed at restricting diversity programs and social activism at Florida's public universities has stirred confusion, with some saying its broadly worded passages could limit free speech. So the Florida Board of Governors will be meeting in early November and to talk about this new DEI rule, and then they'll pass it or, or uh, they'll vote to pass or not in January. Um, what's what? Why should we be? be paying attention to how DEI programs are being attacked at public institutions? Well, it should be noted that the, this targeting is politically motivated. You know, this is a part of Governor DeSantis's witch hunt when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. And there really is no evidence that has been provided that DEI programs are dangerous. Uh, in fact, DEI programs have been demonstrated to um, help students of different backgrounds, including veterans who live with PTSD, students with disabilities, low-income students, students of color, LGBTQ plus students. You know, DEI has worked to ensure that students of all these diverse backgrounds have the ability to reach their fullest potential, that we're creating unity among diverse student bodies versus division and and all of the biggest and most successful companies not only have DI initiatives, but um, they embrace diversity as a means to increase their uh, production and, of course, to expand their clients. So we are not preparing our students for the international workforce, the next generation of talent when we ban such programs. But some of the concerns stems from the fact that we have First Amendment violations rooted in what the legislature and now the Board of Governors are trying to do. The Board of Governors are the regulatory arm of the state university system. And as you noted, they have a, a proposed regulation right now that would uh, define DEI in very political terms um, that would create a chilling effect across the university system for our uh, faculty and for our students. Now, it does provide a attempted carve out with student fees, which are, are what pay for things like student organizations. However, there is a concern that faculty would not sponsor student organizations who may engage in things like social activism or racial justice, so forth, because of their job security. 
Now, litigation, at least one lawsuit has already been filed challenging some of the policies within this this law. But uh, we are we, we suspect that this new DI rule uh, may be debated and discussed at the November 8th and 9th Board of Governors meeting hosted at the University of Central Florida. So I know the United Faculty of Florida and others are organizing around that. And we are encouraging people to send their comments to the BOG about this proposed regulation for fear of its censorship of higher education and for its degradation of higher education as we're not going to be able to compete at a national or international scale if we ban these programs. And it's not just diversity programs, also at colleges and universities. Uh, there's a new state law that prohibits instruction on certain topics in general education courses at state colleges and universities. And yesterday, a federal judge heard arguments in a challenge to that. The challenge was filed by the group NCF Freedom and several New College of Florida professors and students that seek to block higher education officials from enf enforcing parts of the law why should people be concerned whether uh, certain in instruction on certain topics is being blocked at Florida's colleges and universities? Well, this is a clear violation of the First Amendment, which really is the foundation for this lawsuit as well. You have a supermajority Republican legislature attempting to insert conservative orthodoxy into our classrooms in higher education. Regardless of if you went to college or if you went to a Florida college, this should be alarming to you because we are inserting a political ideology into the content of college classrooms, which is, again, not only a clear violation of the First Amendment, but uh, an attempt to insert propaganda into a, a curriculum for higher education. This should not be happening at any level of education, but especially the collegial environment. It is deeply inappropriate to censor free speech. So I'm very hopeful that we'll get positive results from this lawsuit. And as we saw with the Anti-Woke Act year, a year prior, implementation of that policy in the business sector and in higher education was stopped by the courts because of the First Amendment being violated. Our guest is State Representative Anna Escamani, a Democrat from the Orlando area. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from WMNF. The Florida Sheriff's Association is is backing Governor Ron DeSantis in a lawsuit about the suspension of Orlando area state attorney Monique Worrell, the, the state attorney from where you are. Um, what do you what can you say about that that whole situation where uh, Ms. Worrell was suspended and is suing and now the Florida Sheriff's Association is backing the governor? This is another example of a, a politically motivated suspension. You know, Monique Worrell was duly elected with more than 60 percent of the vote, and she ran on a campaign focused on reform and focused on accountability, including accountability of law enforcement who broke the law. And because she was so aggressive in, in pursuing this vision for safety and justice, where she did hold law enforcement officers accountable when it came to breaking the law or exercising uh, excessive force, there is tension with our local sheriff and her, which was a part of the removal. And in fact, records did show, much like we saw with the removal of Andrew Warren, that there were conversations between different sheriff's departments and the governor's office. So I, I'm sad to see that type of division because I do think our justice system works when everyone is being collaborative and focusing on the best interests of public safety over individual agencies, but unfortunately that is not the case. And again, uh, the Florida Sheriff's Association has overwhelmingly sided with the Republicans, regardless of the issue. In fact, I think one of the worst examples of this was Permalis Carey, where the Sheriff's Association changed their viewpoint because of the governor and his agenda, creating an environment where no one is, is more safe. And so to see them uh, once more aligned with the governor is not surprised me, but it also, again, uh, leads to the reality of the political climate where decisions are not made based on merit. They're not based on what's in the public's interest. It's purely just political ambition. The next topic I want to talk about is pride, uh, LGBTQ pride. You just participated in Orlando Pride, and I wanted to find out from you the 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 atmosphere there, especially since some pride celebrations have been canceled in Florida with the current climate that's going on. Um, yeah, let me ask you about that first. Yeah, well, I, I want to 
I want to note that the lawsuit challenging the ban on drag performers uh, was led by uh, an Orlando restaurant, an Orlando-based restaurant that many folks might know called Hamburger Mary's. And the owners of that restaurant uh, were honored at the Equality Florida Gala for their leadership in filing that lawsuit. And they were also marshals of our parade. So we take a lot of pride, pun intended, of our community, of our leadership, and of being an inclusive community here in Orlando. And it was an amazing weekend. Uh, thousands of people came to celebrate pride. And I just feel so lucky to represent and to serve in a community that embraces diversity instead of trying to use it as a tool of division. And I want to ask you about a bill that you filed. It's a bill to, you've refiled a bill to reach 100% renewable energy. And you say that a clean energy economy will help to build a more sustainable future for our state, create new jobs and help mitigate risk that shows up in our property insurance rates. So if it is passed, how would your bill work? Well, thank you so much for uplifting this. This is a policy that I have filed every year now since I was elected to office. And essentially, Florida as a sunshine state is not a leader in uh, energy production with renewables, even though we have the greatest potential in the country to do so. And, and though we have seen an, an exciting and fantastic growth of solar uh, uh, manufacturers and rooftop installers and so forth, Florida has yet to establish any type of energy efficiency goals that are ambitious. We don't have renewable energy goals and we don't have energy uh, um, carbon neutrality goals either. So this policy will put into place these types of goals to be 100% renewable energy based by 2050 and carbon neutral by 2051. These are uh, pretty modest goals, candidly, compared to other states. But I know that we're a big state and we're a state that requires um collaboration to reach goals. And so I, I, I'm willing to compromise on an extended timeline if we actually could get this done. And not only is it a, is it a job creator, but it leads to stronger public health outcomes, cleaner air. Um, it, it would help address r racial injustice tied to the environment here in Florida. Um, and also part of our policy proposal that we filed alongside Senator Lori Berman would create a economic task force to pursue a clean energy economy and to also integrate our higher ed institutions in that effort because obviously to transition to clean energy requires a talent pipeline. And we want to make sure that our HBCUs are part of that dialogue and a part of that effort uh, to develop the next pipeline of clean energy workforce. So it's an exciting policy. I am proud to also be the chair of the Climate and Energy Caucus of the Florida Legislature. And I, I do what I can to you know fight back against the utility monopolies who are not only increasing our rates, but not allowing for such renewable energy goals to be established. Unfortunately, you know, many of these private actors, they're just driven by the bottom line. They're not driven by what's good for the planet. And though they are advancing towards renewables, uh, they're doing it at a rate that is substantially slower than what we need. And that's why setting these goals, as other states have already done, is, is essential for me. Well, we began this interview talking about a special session that's coming up in the Florida legislature, but I want to ask about one more bill that will be heard pr presumably in the regular session coming up in January. House Bill 49 would undo decades of vital protections from for, for, for Florida's children and allow for the increased exploitation of child workers in the Sunshine State is what you retweeted an article from FloridaPolicy.org. So uh, what would House Bill 49 do and why are you opposed to it? This is such a, a dangerous policy proposal that would allow for children to be exploited by corporations uh, by, as you noted, eliminating our child labor protection laws. You know, part of the Republican talking point on this has been we're conforming to federal child labor laws. And it should be noted that federal child labor laws have not been updated in decades and are the floor, not the ceiling for what we can do to protect our kids and ensure that they can focus on school while working part-time uh, so that they can not only develop income if they need to or wish to, but that they can also complete that high school diploma, which is essential to the economic future of, of any adult here in the Sunshine State and 
of course, throughout the country. I'm very concerned that this will predominantly target low wealth families and families of color. And it should be noted as well that this is backed by a conservative think tank that has committed itself to weakening labor laws in the country. And the ultimate goal of corporations and supporting this policy to allow more children to work longer hours is to saturate the workforce so they don't have to pay us more and they don't have to offer better benefits. So we have to remember the root purpose of this. It is to weaken the power of workers, is to saturate the environment with children who will not be paid a wage that is livable, but it will bring down wages for everyone else. So we really have to look at this in a critical way and understand that it's not about allowing children to have more work experience they already can. It really is about exploiting low wealth kids and hurting the uh, the environment for all workers by reducing any incentive a corporation will have to increase wages or increase benefits. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on Tuesday Cafe today, Representative Escamani. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad you could join us and take your time out of your day. I appreciate that. And we're going to and Anna, sorry, Anna Escamani is a state representative from the Orlando area. Thanks so much. We're going to turn now to an update from a story we've been following for years. Uh, it's about springs and bottled water in Florida. You may recall that a bottled watering plant in the Ginny Springs area of Gilchrist County had ties to the multinational company Nestle, and it had applied for a permit renewal to pump about a million gallons of fresh water a day for bottling. There was a lot of public outcry, and the Suwannee River Water Management District said in 2020 that it would not issue the permit to Seven Springs Water Company. The, ch the company challenged that permit, and that decision that is, in 2021, an administrative law judge sided with Seven Springs, which led to the Water Management District approving the permit. That decision was challenged by the Florida Springs Council, which led to a different judge's decision last week that recommended that the Water Management District approve the permit. So we'll talk all about that now with our guest, who is a water advocate in North Central Florida, who lives and works in Fort White. Marilee Mullwitz Gibson is a longtime board director for our, the Our Santa Fe River not-for-profit organization. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Marilee. Thank you for having me, Sean. Good to be here. Um, yeah, I'm glad you could join us. And before we talk about this latest court opinion, let's get a little bit of back. Excuse me, a little bit, bit of background. Some people in our audience might not have ever been to the Ginny Springs complex. So tell us, what are the springs like in that area? In the Santa Fe River between State Road 20, uh, between US 27 Bridge and State Road 47 Spring, um, Bridge, there are 52 known springs. So it's one of the highest concentrations of springs in, in, a, in a riverway, in a landscape. Uh, within a nine mile, 10 mile stretch of any waterway anywhere in the whole wide world. <laughs> so we have an abundance amount of um, springs. Most of them are so small, you can barely find them, but we do have some first and second magnitude springs on this particular stretch of river. And bottling um, has been an interest since the 1980s. Uh, this particular water use permit got secured in the 90s. And we're, it was a 20 year permit that came up for renewal and we're still fighting it. So um, the springs are glorious. They're absolutely beautiful. But, but as maybe some of you know, um, about a month or two, Blue Springs, Gilchrist Blue Springs, which is directly next to this bottling operation, had a collapse in its system. So there is uh, information at the Florida Springs Institute uh, website about the collapse at Gilchrist Blue Springs. Um, and uh, there's a lot of factors there. There's um, We have a, a development uh of landscape sheet flow issue with uh, loss of um, uh, ground, loss of dirt uh, during rain events. And a lot of uh, dirt, uh, sand in that in, in Blue Springs uh, situation was uh, filling up into the cavity of the spring vent, but also there's reduced flows here. So it's like a, it's like a, uh, one one is uh, indicative of the other. So if you're if sand is coming into a spring vent and the water's not discharging uh, strong enough um, um, consecutively for you know for tens of, of, of decades for decades, um, then then you may have more sand sediment coming into a spring vent versus having it constantly force its way downstream, which is how a normal healthy spring vent would would operate. Well, anyway, so. 
So yeah, we, we have some um, beautiful springs, Gilchrist Blue Springs, Ginny Springs, uh, Devil's Eye Complex, July Springs, Rum Island Spring, uh, even Mermaid, Jonathan, Sit in Bathtub, whatever you want to call that particular spring. Even that spring is in this particular uh, water extraction location. So a lot of beautiful springs there. And this company called Seven Springs already has a permit to pump water from Ginny Springs and to bottle it. So what what made it that so many people became opposed to the permit being renewed? What's the key here about the renewal? Yeah, they were opposed to it before that. Um, interestingly, I met a lot of the individuals that were working in the 90s trying to be in opposition of this particular water use at this location. And at that time, there was there was no internet. There was no um, way to communicate effectively with wide uh, groups of people other than word of mouth. And um, when we started, when our Santa Fe River started, uh, because that permit did eventually get issued, and there were still protests um, when our Santa Fe River got on the bandwagon against bottling uh, uh, the springs out of the Santa Fe River in 2006, 2007, we found out that there were four more bottling operations coming into the Santa Fe River because this one was so successful or whatever that looks like to people. So we did the word of mouth thing because again, we. <laughs> We had limited, uh, and I don't even think Facebook existed when we first started this. If it did, we weren't using it. And we did use some emailing. Um, I eventually figured out a way to um, share really important information with larger groups of people. But but we did community things. We had meetings in every little community place that we could have meetings every week <laughs> for um, almost eight years. And we were able to stop those four water bottling operations from even trying to get the permits they wanted. But that one, the Jenny Springs one, which is what everybody calls it around here, while we were fighting these others, everybody was like, you've got to fight that one. And we knew that you can't, once a permit's issued, it, it, it's, it's, it's so hard, other than violations, which we did try and track and monitor, um, it's so hard to, to get them to stop the permit. So we waited for the window of opportunity, which would have been a renewal. And this is why you saw so much, so much going on over this permit, because a lot of the people involved with trying to stop this Ginny Springs permit had already been engaged in many different ways over the years with our Santa Fe Rivers trying to stop water permits in general. We actually also helped with CISA. Up at Wasissa, Nestle, Nestle was trying to come in with a uh, uh, transfer station for bottled water for spring or uh, spring fed water out of that particular system in Jefferson County. And we gave them, you know, our information on how we worked to stop those four bottling plants. And um, there, there have been several other um, statewide uh, campaigns to stop bottling operations out of these communities. These are corporate-led grabs of our public water supply. And the, the 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 most interesting thing or compelling thing with this particular permit is uh, it, it represents roughly 11, commun 11 cities, um, for instance, Branford, Fort White, Bell, Trenton, these small communities that exist in our landscape up here using water. Uh, for their, you know, residents that pay their their utility bills, and that one permit it represents about eleven of these communities. And while we talk about this bottled water grab of our freshwater resources for the springs and for our communities, we also have to consider all of these people that are moving here, <laughs> because there are a lot of people coming to North Central Florida for all kinds of altruistic reasons want to be in the country, want to have fresh water, want to have a nice community where they can raise their children in, you know, a country kind of community where everybody's nice and friendly, all these wonderful things. But the reality is we keep giving the water away to corporations that, that take water and remove it completely, completely out of the cycle. I mean, unless you're sitting at home drinking a bottle of water and you live in Fort White and you happen to use your toilet, you know what I mean? That water is going somewhere else. And that is, a, and not only that, it's going in plastic for God's sake. Yeah, come on, it's plastic. It's going in plastic so we can pollute the world with our fresh water from Jenny Springs from the Santa Fe River. Our guest is Marilee Malwitz Gibson, who is on the board of directors for the Our Santa Fe River not for profit organization. And we're talking about Florida's fresh water springs and water resources. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live from the studios of WMNF in Tampa on October 24th. 
If you'd like to email us, you can send it to dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. So people might be used to connecting this bottling operation that we're talking about here with 7Cs with the company Nestle. The bottling facility is owned by Blue Triton Brands. The permit would be close to a million gallons a day. Is Nestle still connected to this project? Yeah, so uh, the company is Seven Springs Water Company. Uh, it was misprinted as Seven Seas, I think, in, which is kind of ironic given Blue Triton's new identity with this bottling operation. But anyway, um, <laughs> Seven Springs Water Company is the uh, family-run business associated with Ginny Springs Campground that actually owns this $115 a year Actually, for the entire life of the permit, I'm sorry, $115 permit from the state of Florida, from the water management district in, in the Suwannee County or Suwannee area, Suwannee River Basin area. So um, uh, the, uh, I'm kind of track with that one, trying to correct some names here. Oh yeah, Blue Triton, of course. Yeah, so Blue Triton is a multinational um uh, kind of uh, um, investment company, um, or, or they got their money from a multi-international investment company called One Rock. One Rock gave uh, a billion or two dollars to uh, Blue Triton uh, Holdings Corporation so that they could continue to go on and do whatever kind of business they do. The business they do is buying out distressed companies. And so when they bought out Nestle Waters North America, which is a particular uh, brand uh, that Nestle had created um, within their within their all of their brands that they sell to you know consumers, that particular brand got sold to Blue Triton. Um, it is an investment company, and and honestly, uh, the owners of that company, uh, the Metropolises, uh, not spelled quite like that. It's spelled a little differently. Um, anyway, they um, they bellied up uh, uh, some money to the to the to the bar, so to speak, to buy this this huge freshwater industry in North America. Um, but they also used investor money, and so now the question is, um, how long can they be sustainable with investor money? This company also bought Twinkies, by the way, and I think Paps Blue Ribbon, um, and so they were able to turn Twinkies around. They were able to automate it more and make it more uh, uh, productive. Um, and in our particular situation, uh, the plant at uh, at uh, Jenny Springs or at um, off of County Road 340, uh, that has been uh, over $20 million or some absurd amount of money has been used to upgrade the system. So uh, as far as employment, when, uh, when Coca-Cola Danani owned it, there were over 150 employees. When uh, Ice River Springs owned this facility, there were, I was told, between 15 and 25 employees. They weren't running full throttle. None of these were running full, excuse me, full throttle. All of them are using under 300,000 gallons of water a day, even though the permit was much larger. In our situation, with the build outs and with all of these um, scrubbing of the, of the wells and building new wells, they added an additional third well here. With all of these uh, infrastructure systems put in place, Blue Triton has every uh, every ability to take 984,000 gallons of water a day out of the uh, Ginny Springs complex or the Devil's Eye complex, depending on how you call it. So, um, yeah, we're concerned. We're concerned to see in the past only up to 300,000 has ever been used and it's already been, we've already seen declining uh, water levels, declining um, uh, uh, loss of submerged aquatic vegetation. We've already seen changes in our waterway at these particular ex extraction locations. And then knowing that an additional 600,000 gallons or so uh, will also be removed um, every day, every day. It's gonna go out right out of the, because um, these are only within a mile of, of, the, um, of the springs and less than, actually I think one of them is even less than a mile away from the spring itself. So it will have an influence on some sort of discharge associated with these springs that are already weak and diminished. 
the minimum flows and levels are showing that where we, we have impairment. Um, the base and management action plans, which are designed to, to um, address nutrient loading, we have issues with that. And if we keep extracting more and more water, it will just see more and more pollution and more and more harm coming to any of the springs that need that type of pressure, need that type of hydrology to exist. And so that's a lot of the information that was taken into account by the scientists at the Suwannee River Water Management District when they originally recommended against renewing the permit. So is there anything else that they pointed out, pointed to that, that said that they were concerned about having this permit be reissued? They, uh, the type of work they did at that time addressing the environmental harms um, simultaneously, they were also trying to um, change those minimum flows and levels to make it easier for permits to be issued. So, yeah, they were keyed into those those reasonings, but ultimately, uh, the idea that they could uh, easily have a facility to take that kind of capacity of water was really the type of direction they went as a water management. Um, public interest was not on, on uh, it was hardly even part of the decision making and, and Judge Folks uh, describes that in her ruling uh, last week when she uh, denied, denied Florida Springs Council um, the, the, um, the, to, to stop the permit. Uh, and she said basically that public interest do, isn't defined in Florida administrative code rule and public interest is mentioned twice in code rule when it addresses these types of water use permits with the three prong test. Is it reasonable and beneficial? Um, and so to, to have that kind of um, that kind of almost in a sense nonsensical it doesn't make sense to me if public interest is a is a is a line item in a in a in a code rule then it should be also in florida statute somewhere to to say that we can use public i mean why why else would public interest be in these types of rules it's got to be identified somewhere so when 19,000 people nearly every one of them not every one of them of course but nearly every one of them was in opposition to issuance of this water use permit at Jenny Springs those comments were completely ignored um, and she thought that that was a fine thing to do, that we didn't have to address the public comments. And I think I think more and more that um, public interest really needs to be um, um, uh, levied more in these state agencies rules because we all live here. I live next to the river. You know, I live within a mile, a mile and maybe not even a half of the extraction point. And so my my I'm affected by that, and I'm more more significantly nature is affected by that. And for the human encroachment that we are all, including myself, engaged with, uh, everything we can do to to pull back instead of do more uh, harm to our water resources or our natural resources is is imperative. Because I, I listen, that somebody just scrubbed out the Itchitakni this weekend. I I just watched videos and, and photographs of the Itchituckney and somebody came along with a barge and took out all the trees that fell down in the river or that got snags or whatever that was where the where the where the the fish and the turtles and the habitat and the snakes and all those wonderful things that call the Itchituckney home have now been removed. So it looks like a theme park, like like a water slide. <laughs> Yikes. I don't, you know, you get involved with these situations and you wonder, like, what is the best thing for for nature habitat for people? And when when you have so many people making decisions that go so counterintuitively to how nature should be, it's just it's it, it's a hamster kind of thing for me. And I got to jump off soon. Can you like, stay till 1101? Oh, I see. Never mind. I mean, like off the hamster. Off the, We're speaking with Mary, wheel, my friend. We're speaking with Marilee yeah. Malwitz Gibson, who is on the board of directors for the Our Santa Fe River not for profit organization. We're talking about Florida Springs. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Let's talk about another unpopular proposal recently that has to do with North Florida Springs. We'll move away from Ginny Springs for a moment and we'll go over to Wakulla Springs. It's one of the largest springs in the world. In August, the Wakulla County Board of County Commissioners seemed just about to approve a gas station being built right above an underground river that's part of the Wakulla Springs cave network. But there was so much public outcry that now it looks like there will be a land swap instead, perhaps protecting the land that's above the cave 
and building the gas station somewhere else. What can you tell us about the latest for Wakulla Springs and that proposed gas station? Uh, that's very interesting. So what is happening now is the city recognizing the community's complaints is trying to work with the developer and the agencies are involved too, um, water management, DEP, whoever can, you know, kind of get on tag team with this particular development on top of a, a very important spring uh, system. So what they're trying to do is swap land, just a compelling idea. So uh, if, if they can, uh, if, the, if all the powers that be, including the property owner who wants to build this gas station, uh, can swap land with a, uh, uh, a mutually compatible arrangement somewhere else off of a highway within the same corridor that this gas company wants to be in or, or close enough to it. Um, and that is one of the problems, actually. Um, anyway, that's what they're trying to work on, which is a, it's a, it's an interesting concept. And I hope more people that have these types of lands that find out that, hey, I just bought land that's really sensitive um, can actually see the bigger picture and say, oh, well, maybe there is some sort of other um, land somewhere else that wouldn't be so harmful to to the things that we're all trying to protect. So, yeah, it's a, it's um, I don't know if there's any final decisions yet, because <laughs> the gas station owner, of course, wants that corner. You know, location, location, location. <laughs> so you know, one so of the interesting, uh, we'll see how that develops. One of the interesting things about this is it might have just gone under the radar. It, it might have just happened and, and uh, you know, have a new gas station up in a few months. But there was a huge public outcry. What happened at those meetings? I attended one of them uh, and the, the meeting was so large and I've never really seen a lar uh, meeting quite that large. Everybody was outside milling around the receipts or Shea, Shea was in the middle of the hot, hot summer, hot, hot summer day uh, or e afternoon. And so, yeah, um, it, it didn't take long for the commissioners actually to just, um, uh, there was some discussion inside. I didn't make it inside, frankly, but just to watch the the emotion outside is what I thought was even more interesting. The fact that people came from so far um, to actually stand outside in the heat of the day to to be opposed to this. So having public outcry like that really helps. Um, I, I think that was why they they didn't, I think they tabled it, I think was the final outcome that particular day. So it could come back up for some sort of review, of course. Um, but it was um, it was a good day for Floridians to see that in action because there was another, uh, there was another uh, gas, sta that gas station development that uh, wanted to go into Crystal River area. All of this happening at the same time. And that particular one was voted on and approved and whatever. And they were going through the motions of actually building this thing. And sure enough, they hit water, surface water uh, or groundwater, however you want to relate to it down on Crystal River. So um, so they had to put their project on hold. And I think it's over. And I don't think they can even develop there. I don't know where that's going now, but that happens too. So developers, human encroachment, the way that we're developing on top of our uh, Springs Heartland, um, uh, I'm hoping developers that hear this type, these types of programs go to the Florida Springs Institute, learn as much as they can, go to uh, IFAS um, through the UF Water Institute, um, yeah, UF Water Institute, and learn as much as you can from uh, the Water Institute, uh, from, from UF's point of views, learn as much as they can from any sort of, um, even the agency meetings, when you attend the water management meetings, is, they they are so different in every um, district in the in in the state of Florida, and there are five districts and six if you want to include the Disney fiasco. Um, but there's five, and they're very differently run. And I've been to most of them. Uh, I just didn't make it to North Florida yet, um, but I know the people that are there, and it's all it's it's very interesting. And so you can have a large part of how uh, development moves now because we can't keep doing what we've been doing we already know that well look what we did to south florida what we did to tampa i lived in tampa i know what we did to tampa well i want to thank so you we so can't... okay sorry i'm uh, we're running out of time i want to thank you very much for coming on tuesday cafe Marily. thank you thanks for having me sean i appreciate you coming day. I appreciate you coming on. And Marilee Mulwitz Gibson is a water advocate and is on the board of directors for the Our Santa Fe River not for profit organization. Bernie writes in, he says, anything that happens in North Florida's waters will have a direct effect on all South Florida. So it matters to all of us, all the water flows south. So thanks for that email comment, Bernie. 
I also uh, want to say that Merrily Mullet's Gypsum owns Rum 138. It's a river and springs recreational destination. And I'd like to thank our earlier guest, State Representative Ana Eskamani. If you missed either of these interviews, you can watch them on our website, WMNF.org, beginning this afternoon. I want to thank our phone, phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint, and her guests will give advice about planning for Medicare open enrollment, which opens this month. Next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Thank you to everyone who supported Tuesday Cafe during our recent fun drive. If you like the information that you get here, you can help us make our goal with your donation at WMNF.org. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on October 24th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We're also broadcasting to St. Petersburg, Lakeland, Sarasota, Newport, Ritchie, Clearwater, and beyond. Have a great day, and thanks for supporting WMNF.